All right. We are live from Occupy City Hall. This is our Rockford reading segment. Uh, I've been processing some personal thoughts and beliefs in these last this last week or so. And I had that's why I haven't been doing some of the more candid live from Occupy City Halls where we just have a discussion. Uh, on Thursdays, me and Antar have our, our usual discussion. Uh, that's still playing as, uh, at, at, to this point, that is still in the plan. So I think that that may, that may be the first time I uh, do something outside of the Rockford readings uh, on the lives. Uh, but I, I don't know. That's not 100 percent true. I'm not 100 percent sure about that either. Uh, but I say that to say, uh, let me ask. Let me make sure the audio is right before I, I go into this. I could be doing all this talking for no reason. Oh, all right. I say that to say uh, I'm continuing to do some of these rock for readings more often to just sort of uh, take a moment to like uh, refresh and rejuvenate some of my thoughts and remember some of the things that I've read up to this point and remember some of the uh, uh Ide ideological uh, uh, philosophies and uh, that sort of got me to the place that I'm at. And so uh, before this, we were reading until we, before we started reading autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we were reading uh, uh, In Defense of Looting by Vicki Osterweil, which uh, was a very good read. Uh, then early last week, we began reading an autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr., I'm considering doing like two books at a time uh, on here. I don't know if that's something I'm going to see all the way through or not, but it is something that I'm considering doing. Uh, we got one more city market coming up this Friday, so I want to encourage people to come out to city market on Friday. Uh, then we finish with Food Truck Tuesday for this season. Uh, we'll be back with Food Truck Tuesday next year. Uh, we're going to try to do it, diver diversify it up a little bit. Uh, but... That's the conversation for a different day. Today we are on Chapter 8, The Violence of Desperate Men, in the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, if you're watching this, please share this live also. No matter what point in time you're watching it, please share the live. I'm about to do the same thing, sharing it. Uh, all right, watch and share. All right, there we go. And now on that note, make sure the audio levels is right. All right, let's begin reading Chapter 8, The Violence of Desperate Men. After ascending the mountain on Monday night, I woke up Tuesday morning. Excuse me. After ascending the mountain on Monday night, I woke up Tuesday morning urgently aware that I had to leave the heights and come back to earth. I was faced with a number of organizational decisions. The movement could no longer continue without careful planning. I began to think of the various committees necessary to give the movement guidance and direction. First, we needed a more permanent transportation committee, since the problem of getting the ex-bus riders to, about the city was paramount. We would, also, we would also need to raise money to carry on the protests. Therefore, a finance committee, a finance committee was necessary. Since we will be having regular mass meetings, there must be a program committee for these occasions. And then, I reason, from time to time strategic decisions would have to be made. We needed the best minds of the association to think them through and then make recommendations to the executive board. So I felt that a strategy committee was essential. Uh, I think one of the things I want to take a moment to point out there is the understandings of, of sort of uh, organizational work and organizing and uh, <clears throat> I think that for us uh, as an organization with this being uh, our, or, our origins uh, organizationally and our beginnings organizationally, uh, we're in the process of uh, people uh, who are trying to find a way in which that they can exist in this struggle and find a way they can contribute to this struggle, uh, coming in and finding uh, which areas that uh, they can fit into, whether it be, uh, and all of these things that Dr. King spoke about, them needing uh, committees of in the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association are all still things that are necessary uh, for uh, proper functioning of an organization. Uh, strategic decisions, it needs to be people that are uh, uh, involved organizationally that can make strategic decisions. People 
people who are involved organizationally that can uh, organize and set up mass meetings, uh, help with financing, uh, uh, and then, you know, help with raising money to carry on protests. These are all things that are still uh, very relevant to uh, how any uh, organization needs to be ran. And so uh, there may be people who feel as if uh, marching on a crosswalk is not something that uh, they can uh, exist doing, but maybe they feel like they could exist uh, helping to mobilize people, uh, helping going door to door to pass out pamphlets or uh, helping or inboxing people, virtually going door to door, inboxing people links to certain things. Uh, maybe it's people who feel like uh, they can't do that, but maybe they can uh, do research or maybe they can be involved on involved in uh, some of the legal uh, aspects of things. Uh, there are a multitude of ways in which uh, people can exist and we need people to exist in order for this struggle that we're waging to be a successful one. And I think that that's something that to uh, always keep in mind, uh, that we all have our own uh, gifts and talents that we can use uh, to help uh, in police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And that's something that uh, we should never forget. From the beginning of the protests, Ralph Abernathy was my closest associate and most true and most truest friend. We prayed together and made important decisions together. His ready good humor lightened many tense moments. Whenever I went out of town, I always left him in charge of the important business of the association, knowing that it was in safe hands. After Roy Bennett left Montgomery, Ralph became vice president of the MIA and has held that position ever since with dignity and efficiency. In the early stages of the protest, the problem of transportation demanded most of our attention. The labor and ingenuity that went into that task is one of the most interesting sides of the Montgomery story. For the first few days, we had depended on the Negro taxi companies who had agreed to transport the people for the same 10 cent fare that they paid on the buses. Sorry about that. One second, lost my spot. Uh, but during the first, quote, negotiation meeting, end quote, that we held with the city commission on Thursday, December 8th, police commissioner Sellers mentioned in passing that there was a law that limited the taxis to a minimum fare. I caught this hint and realized that commissioner Sellers would probably use this point to stop the taxis from assisting in the protest. At that moment, I remember that sometime previously, my good friend, the Reverend Theodore Jemison, had led a bus boycott in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Knowing that Jemison and his associates had set up an effective private carpool, I put in a long-distance call to ask him for suggestions for a similar pool in Montgomery. As I expected, his painstaking description of the Baton Rouge experience was invaluable. I passed on word of Seller's remarks and, Jim and Jemison's advice to the Transportation Committee and suggested that we immediately begin setting up a pool in order to offset the confusion which could come if the taxis were eliminated from service. Fortunately, a mass meeting was being held that night. There I asked all those who were willing to offer their cars to give us their names, addresses, telephone numbers, and the hours that they could drive before leaving the meeting. The response was tremendous. More than 150 side slips volunteering their automobiles. Some who were not working offered to drive in the carpool all day. Others volunteered a few hours before and after work. Practically all of the ministers offered to drive whenever they were needed. On Friday afternoon, as I had predicted, police commissioner issued an order to all of the cab companies reminding them that by law, they had to charge a minimum fare of 45 cents and that failure to comply would be a legal offense. This brought an end to the cheap taxi service. Uh, and then I think it's, what's important to point out there is, uh, again, the type of deception and subterfuge and uh, nefarious means that are used by uh, police departments, uh, that are used by uh, state governments uh, in an effort to thwart people's uh, right to protest, in an effort to uh, thwart people's right to demonstrate, in an effort to thwart people's right to petition their government. And these things don't always come in a violent nature, always come in a brutal nature. Uh, they don't even always come in an overt nature. Uh, there are a lot of times in which they can come in a, a very uh, covert nature. What'd you say? Bannon, uh, we just, it was just brought up, Bannon, uh, me and multiple people from City Hall for writing down uh, messages in chalk. 
uh, and an unlawful ban at that. Uh, and so you see how these things regularly uh, are uh, used by these institutions. Uh, and the, a lot of times that's the, the, the first manner that they use is they, uh, as we will see here, violence has not been something that has been being implemented yet in Montgomery, but it is something that will uh, 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 come in the future. Uh, arrests are something that will come in the future. And so uh, it's important uh, rem uh, it's important for us to be not only reading these, the literature and reading this information, uh, but being able to uh, uh, comprehend it and then extrapolate it out to what it is that we're experiencing and be able to compare and contrast uh, to be able to take uh, ideology, take philosophy, or even if it's just as uh, something as simple as understanding history and understanding that history repeats itself uh, and understanding that it's doomed to repeat itself uh, if we do not learn from the mistakes or learn from the things that have happened in history. Uh, and so part of uh, uh, of, of, of partaking in these protests and demonstrations and partake, trying to partake in these movement building uh, aspects is understanding what tactics will be used against you. Just as important as it is to understand the tactics that you would implement, uh, it's important to also understand the, tap the tactics that will be implemented against you. And so we see that the ta one of the tactics that the uh, police commissioner and the police department, uh, what's up, what's up, what's up, uh, using in this method is uh, trying to force the cab drivers who are willing to make this sacrifice for the struggle, uh, willing to make this, uh, uh, to do this uh, as far as their place to exist in the revolution, which is what we were just pointing out earlier. Uh, maybe for the cab, you know, the cab drivers didn't take the bus, so it was no way for them to contribute by uh, not riding the bus, uh, but they could contribute by lowering their fares uh, and sacrificing how much money they were making that day in order to further what they understood was bigger than themselves. And so also one of the things we should take away is understanding that we need more of our community members to be uh, like the cab drivers in Montgomery and be willing to sacrifice for their fellow man, for their fellow person. Our answer was to call hastily on our volunteers who responded immediately. They started out simply by cruising the streets of Montgomery with no particular system. On Saturday, the ministers agreed to go to their pulpits the following day and seek additional recruits. Again, the response was tremendous. With the new addition, the number of cars swelled to about 300. Thousands of mommyograph leaflets were distributed throughout the Negro community with the list of the 48 dispatch and the 42 pickup stations. The white opposition was so impressed at this miracle of quick organization that they had to admit in a white citizens council meeting that the pool moved with, quote, military precision, end quote. The, MI, the Montgomery Improvement Association had worked out in a few nights a transportation problem that the bus company had grappled with for many years. Uh, and I think that it's important to point out there that's because... Uh, the uh, necessity is the uh, mother of invention. I think that's how the uh, statement goes. Uh, and so I think one of the things that will happen when uh, we collectively get to a place where we're waging this struggle uh, in, 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 in bigger quantities and bigger numbers is that you'll see things that may have seemed like they were impossible or unlikely or improbable to be done uh, when people are on the same accord and are struggling for something that is bigger than themselves. Uh, they will find ways to... Uh, uh, they will find ways to share those things, accomplish those things. Oh, blocked. <laughs> uh, okay, I just blocked somebody. That was fun. Please, if you, if please, if you are watching this, and uh, you a racist or some type of a troll, please leave a comment so I can see your comment and block you. Okay, let's continue. Despite the success. So, so profoundly had the spirit of the protest become a part of the people's lives that sometimes they even preferred to walk when a ride was available. The act of walking, for many, had become of symbolic importance. Once a poor driver stopped beside an elderly woman who was trudging along with obvious difficulty. Quote, jump in, grandmother, end quote, he said. Quote, you don't need to walk, end quote. She waved him on. Quote, I'm not walking for myself. End quote, she explained. Quote, I'm walking for my children and my grandchildren. End quote. And she continued walking home on foot. While the largest number of drivers were ministers, their ranks were augmented by housewives, teachers, businessmen, and unskilled laborers. At least three white men from the air bases drove in the pool during their off-duty hours. One of the most faithful drivers was Mrs. A.W.S., 
who had early shown her enthusiasm for the protest idea by helping to call the civic leaders to the first organizing meeting. Every morning, she drove her large green Cadillac to her assigned dispatch station, and for several hours in the morning and again in the afternoon, one could see this distinguished and handsome gray-haired chauffeur driving people to work and home again. Another loyal driver was Joanne Robinson. Attractive, fair-skinned, and still youthful, Joanne came by her goodness naturally. She did not need to learn her nonviolence from any book. Apparently, inde in indef indefatigable. Oh my God. Dr. King be having these words. All right. Apparently indefatigable, she, perhaps, more than any other person, was active on every level of the protest. She took part in both the executive board and the strategy committee meetings. When the MIA newsletter was inaugurated a few months after the protest began, she became its editor. She was sure to be present whenever negotiations were in progress. And although she carried a full teaching load at Alabama State, she still found time to drive both morning and afternoon. The rank of our drivers were further swelled from an unforeseen source. Many white housewives, whatever their commitment to segregation, had no intention of being without their maids. And so every day they drove to the Negro sections to pick up their servants and return them at night. Certainly, if selfishness was a part of the motive, in many cases affection for a faithful servant also played motive. There was some humor in the tacit understandings and sometimes mutually accepted misunderstandings between these white employers and their Negro servants. One old domestic and influential matriarch to many young relatives in Montgomery was asked by her wealthy employer, quote, isn't this bus boycott terrible, end quote. The old lady responded, quote, yes, ma'am, it sure is. And I just told all my youngest that this kind of thing is white folks' business, and we just going to stay off the buses till they get this whole thing settled, end quote. Uh, and then so one of the things I want to point out in that section uh, that we read is, uh, again, the example of different of existing uh, of, of waging the revolution on the level in which we exist. And so we see how different people from different backgrounds, uh, a, a teacher from a, a professor from Alabama, uh, housewives, excuse me, housewife, a professor from Alabama, uh, a woman who was a housewife who was coming in on a time off was driving people uh, back and forth, pastors, the, uh, the congregation of pastors, all of these different people uh, participated in picking up where the taxi drivers of Montgomery uh, left off at. The taxi driver started off with the 10 cents. Uh, and once they were no, what, mo removed from a tactical, because of a tactical decision, uh, there was a, a, a new set of people, a new set of soldiers uh, to pick up where they left off at. Uh, and each one and each set of these soldiers came from different backgrounds and different experiences. Uh, they talked about the, peop the two white men who came from uh, the naval base to drive people back and forth. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to, uh, again, to be reminded that we don't, everybody doesn't have to be outside of City Hall. Everybody doesn't have to be marching on a crosswalk. Everybody doesn't have to be uh, uh, having, doing a live from Occupy City Hall. But there are uh, different ways that we can contribute, even if that means carving out your own way to contribute. Uh, even if that means uh, finding the moments in which you are in a place to contribute as well. Uh, and then another one of the things to point out is, uh, is also understanding uh, uh, what exerting pressure and exerting leverage is like. And so there was a, a, an exertion of leverage and an, an exertion of pressure uh, put onto the uh, white women and to the white families that lived in these communities, uh, that lived in the white communities in these towns, when they had to face the uh, dilemma of their black housemaids not coming into work because the bus wasn't going to get them and because now the police had did something so that the taxis were too much for them to afford and that these because the the the, the housemaids were willing to make such a sacrifice were willing to commit to the struggle to such an extent that they would lose their job it exerted the leverage and the pressure onto the uh, uh white families to come out to the white women to uh, the white families white husbands uh to come out 
to the black community and pick them up in the morning, drive them to work and drive them to their homes and then drop them back off at night. Uh, another part in that is understanding your worth, understanding your value and understanding that there has never been a point in time in this society uh, in which it could exist without the poor people. There's never been a point in time in this society which it could exist without the working class people. There's never been a point in time in this society where it could exist without black people, without indigenous people, without people of color. Uh, and so the, 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 the even though we come from minority groups and, and a oppressed, marginalized, exploited groups. This society can't exist without any of these groups. And so once we understand our worth and our value to that extent, uh, that also work towards building pressure and building leverage uh, for us to uh, uh, begin to get monicums of justice and get monicums of freedom and monicums of liberty. Uh, and so I think that that's, again, another one of the things that uh, is important to point out in, uh, in the section that we read there. And again, a lot of these things go into the uh, tactics category, less into the ideology category, some into the ideology category as well, but a lot into the tactics category. <clears throat> All right, we're on page 67, chapter 8 of Autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. From the beginning, a basic philosophy guided the movement. This guiding principle has since been referred to variously as nonviolent resistance, non cooperation, and passive resistance. But in the first days of the protest, none of these expressions was mentioned. The phrase most often heard was, quote, Christian love, end quote. It was the Sermon on the Mount, rather than the doctrine of passive resistance, that initially inspired the Negroes of Montgomery to dignify social action. It was Jesus of, Na it was Jesus of Nazareth that stirred the Negroes to protest with the creative weapon of love. As the days unfolded, however, the inspiration of Mahatma Gandhi began to exert its influence. I had come to see early that the Christian doctrine of love operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence was one of the most potent weapons available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom. About a week after the protest started, a white woman who understood and sympathized with the Negro's efforts wrote a letter to the editor of the Montgomery Advertiser comparing the bus protest with the Gandhian movement in India. Miss Juliet Morgan, sensitive and frail, did not long survive the rejection and condemnation of the white community. But long before she died in the summer of 1957, the name of Mahatma Gandhi was well known in Montgomery. People who had never heard of the little brown saint of India were now saying his name with an air of familiarity. Nonviolent resistance had emerged as the technique of the movement, while love stood as the regulating ideal. In other words, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation, while Gandhi furnished the method. People responded to this philosophy with amazing adore. To be sure, there were some who were slow to concur. Occasionally, members of the executive board would say to me in private that we needed a more militant approach. They looked upon nonviolence as weak and compromising. Others felt that at least the modicum of violence would convince the white people that the Negroes meant business and were not afraid. A member of my church came to me one day and solemnly suggested that it would be to our advantage to, quote, kill off, end quote, eight or ten white people. Quote, this is the only language these white folks will understand, end quote, he said. If we failed, quote, if we fail to do this, they will think we're afraid. We must show them we're not afraid any longer, end quote. Besides, he thought, if a few white persons were killed, the federal government would inevitably intervene, and this, he was certain, would benefit us. Still, others felt that they could be nonviolent only if they were not attacked personally. They would say, quote, if nobody bothers me, I will bother nobody. If nobody hits me, I will hit nobody. But if I'm hit, I will hit back, end quote. They thus drew a moral line between aggressive and retaliatory violence. But in spite of these honest disagreements, the vast majority were willing to try the experiment. In a real sense, Montgomery's Negroes showed themselves willing to grapple with the new approach to the crisis in race relations. It is a philosophy of life, but because of their, excuse me, it is probably true that most of them did not believe in nonviolence as a philosophy of life. But because of their confidence in their leaders and because nonviolence was presented to them as a simple expression of Christianity in action, they were willing to use it as a technique. Admittedly, nonviolence is the truest sense is not a strategy that one uses simply because it is expedient at the moment. Nonviolence is ultimately a way of life that men, in, that men live by because of the sheer morality of his claim. But even granting this, 
The willingness to use nonviolence as a technique is a step forward. For he who goes this far is more likely to adopt nonviolence later as a way of life. What up, what up, what up? And then so uh, to just sort of address nonviolence uh, again, which is something that will be a, a regularity in here because the concept of nonviolence as a strategy and as a philosophy for life is something that is constantly challenged, uh, that Dr. King is constantly challenged on, uh, and he defends uh, that regularly. And so I think one of the things here that uh, I would like to draw a line and a distinction is, uh, in my philosophy and my belief is that there's a difference between violence and self-defense uh, and that's something that Dr. King goes on to say later on in here uh, as well there's a difference between violence and self-defense there's a difference between a person coming and attacking you with the knife uh, and that being an act of violence and you defending yourself from this person uh, stabbing you and killing you with this knife uh, there is uh, a difference between somebody trying to come and uh, punch you and kick you or, or initiate a fight with you, uh, vi a violent altercation with you, and uh, you defending yourself uh, from being assaulted and being harmed and injured in that violent altercation and protecting and preserving your life. Uh, so for me, that is, that's uh, not violence. Uh, Self-defense is not violence. Uh, and so I think one of the uh, other things that I would like to point out uh, as well, uh, when it c comes to a point here, let me see somewhere. Uh, is the idea and then too the idea that uh, if nobody bothers me I will bother nobody if nobody hits me I will hit nobody but if I'm hit I will hit back uh, and part of that, I believe, is understanding that uh, it's not just upon one party to keep a protest peaceful. Uh, too, uh, too often, the onus is put upon the person protesting to keep the protest peaceful. Uh, and then the people who are uh, there as counter protesters or the police department, uh, all of these people and all of these parties are allowed to uh, commit violence and to uh, act unpeaceably or unpeaceably uh, while these demonstrations and protests go on. And then that gets painted as the uh, demonstrator being uh, uh, unpeaceful or violent. And I think even the word peaceful attached to protests in general is, uh, uh, is problematic and is uh, cause for concern. Uh, but let's continue. In spite of the fact that the bus protests have been an immediate success, the city fathers and the bus officials felt that it would fizzle out in a few days. They were certain that the first rainy day would find the Negroes back on the buses. But the first rainy day came and passed and the buses remained empty. In the meantime, the city fathers and the bus officials had expressed their first willingness to negotiate. At a special session of the MIA executive board, a negotiating committee of 12 was appointed and I was chosen to serve as their spokesman. It was agreed that we would present three proposals. One, a guarantee of courteous treatment. Two, passengers to be seated on a first come first serve basis, the Negro seating from the back, and three, employment of Negro bus operators on predominantly Negro routes. The aim of these proposals was frankly no more than a temporary alleviation of the problem that we confronted. We never felt that the first come first serve seating arrangement would provide a final solution since this would eventually have to depend on a change in the law. We were sure, however, that the Rosa Parks case, which was by then in the courts, would be the test that would ultimately bring about the defeat of bus segregation itself. We arrived at the city hall and were directed to the commissioner's chamber. We sat down near the front. The mayor then turned to the Negro delegate delegation and demanded, quote, who was the spokesman, end quote. When all eyes turned toward me, the mayor said, quote, all right, come forward and make your statement, end quote. In the glare of the television lights, I walked slowly toward the front of the room and took a seat at the opposite end. I opened by stating briefly why we found it necessary to, quote, boycott, end quote, the buses. I made it clear that the arrest of Mrs. Parks was not the cause of the protest, but merely the precipitating factor. Quote, our action, end quote, I said, quote, is the culmination of a series of injustices and indignities that have existed over the years, end quote. Uh, and then I think, again, that's something that is important to point out uh, because that's, that is the, the case uh, here, that is what would make thir the same case as May 30th. The things that happened on May 30th uh, uh, 
she did that happen on May 2. George Floyd being murdered, which precipitated May 30th, uh, was not the cause of the things that took place on May 30th. It was the years of indignation, the years of indignation, the years of indignities, the years of, of disrespect, the years of injustice, the years of exploitation, decades of these things that the community, uh, black and brown community, poor and working class community uh, have felt uh, while being inside of this county and inside of this city that, that, uh, that led to and that was the cause of what took place on May 30th. And it was the cause of the, the dying campaigns and some of the things that took place afterwards. And, uh, and that's the same case for when you take it outside of Rockford and you look at these things on a, a, a national and a global level, it is the, uh, the, the years of uh, the hundreds of years of, of injustices and indignities that have existed uh, that have led to uh, that, that lead to these uh, uprisings, these civil uprisings that you see taking place. It's never just the one uh, precipitating act that happened. As soon as I finished, the mayor opened the meeting to general discussion. The commissioners and the attorney for the bus company began raising questions. They challenged the legality of the seating arrangement that we were proposing. They contended that the Negroes were demanding something that would violate the law. We answered by reiterating our previous argument that a first come, first served seating arrangement could exist entirely within the segregation law, as it did in many southern cities. It soon became clear that Jack Crenshaw, the attorney for the bus company, was our most stubborn opponent. Doggedly, he sought to convince the group that there was no way to grant the suggested city proposal without violating the city ordinance. The more Crenshaw talked, the more he won the city fathers to his position. Eventually, I saw that the meeting was getting nowhere and suggested that we bring it to a close. I soon saw that I was the victim of an unwarranted pessimism because I had started out with an unwarranted optimism. Uh, and I want to repeat that again one more time. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I want to repeat that again. I soon saw that I was the victim of an unwarranted pessimism because I had started out with an unwarranted optimism. Uh, and so I think that that is something that we have to uh, keep in mind as well. And when people talk about uh, why, how come you haven't had meetings with the mayor, which uh, uh, you know, is a false narrative anyways, but how come you don't meet with the mayor, or you don't sit at the table, or you don't do anything, or don't you think that changes have been made, or don't you think things are getting better? You know, those are all uh, uh, signs of an unwarranted optimism that certain people have. Uh, and I also understand, uh, and, the, and again, the danger of having an unwarranted optimism is being met with an unwarranted pessimism. Uh, and I think that we have to uh, uh, anchor uh, our actions and our philosophies with realism. Uh, and understand exactly the type of society that we exist in, the type of society that we have existed in uh, historically, and the things that have uh, had to take place historically uh, for alterations to this society. Uh, and so I think that is why realism is something that is important for us to have. <clears throat> I had gone to the meeting with a great illusion. I had believed that the privileged would give up their privileges on request. This experience, however, taught me a lesson. I came to see that no one gives up his privilege without strong resistance. Let me say that one more time. I came to see that no one gives up his privileges without strong resistance. I saw further that the underlying purpose of segregation was to oppress and exploit the segregated, not simply to keep them apart. Even when we ask for justice within the segregation laws, the quote, powers that be, end quote, were not willing to grant it. Justice and equality, I saw, would never come while segregation remained because the basic purpose of segregation was to perpetuate injustice and inequality.
Shortly after this first negotiating conference, I called a meeting of the executive board of the MIA to report the results. The members were disappointed, but agreed that we should stand firm on our three proposals. In the meantime, the mayor sent word that he was calling a citizens committee to meet with the bus officials and Negro leaders in the morning of December 17th. Over a week had passed since the first conference and the protests had still shown no signs of faltering. White members of the committee began to lash out against me. They contended that I was the chief stumbling block to a real solution of the problem. Oh, this win ain't no joke, man. White members of the committee began to lash out against me. They contended that I was the chief stumbling block to a real solution of the problem. For a moment, it appeared that I was alone. Nobody came to my rescue until suddenly Ralph Abernathy was on the floor in my defense. He pointed out that since I was the spokesman for the group, I naturally had to do most of the talking, but this did not mean that I did not have the support of the rest of the committee. By trying to convince the Negroes that I was the main obstacle to solution, the white committee members had helped to divide us among ourselves. But Ralph's statement left no doubt. From this moment on, the white group saw the futility of attempting to negotiate us into a compromise. That Monday, I went home with a heavy heart. I was weighted down by a terrible sense of guilt, remembering that on the two or three occasions I had allowed myself to become angry and indignant. I had spoken hastily and resentfully, yet I knew that this was no way to solve a problem. Quote, you must not harbor anger, end quote, I admonished myself. Quote, you must be willing to suffer the anger of the opponent and yet not return anger. You must not become bitter, no matter how emotional your opponents are, you must be calm, end quote. Uh, and then I want to address that as well. I think that that is, I think that that is something that is, uh, is a very adm admirable thought to live up to. But I think far too often the uh, onus is put on the victim uh, to remain calm. Far, far too uh, often the onus is put on the oppressed to remain calm. Far too often the onus is put on the exploited, uh, the one who has had the injustice uh, done to them, uh, to remain calm and to uh, not become anger and uh, angry and to not be bitter. Uh, and again, I think that those uh, that is a higher consciousness that we should all aspire to live up to, that we should all uh, strive to uh, uh, reach to. But it is not a uh, a condemnation of your uh, right of you being right uh, or even a. It's also not a. Uh, it also does not prove that you are uh, it does not prove that you are right or prove that you are wrong based on the emotion that you use uh, to express uh, why you believe you are right or, or uh, why you believe something that has happened is, uh, is unjust. And I, I sort of butchered through trying to say that I'm trying to find a, a more eloquent way to say it. Uh, but if somebody is uh, has had uh, an injustice done to them and they express it through cussing or express it through yelling, that does not make that injustice that has been done to them any less uh, unjust. Uh, and if somebody has an injustice done to them or is exploited or is oppressed and they uh, articulate it without using any uh, explicit uh, language or articulate it in a way that people uh, deem more respectable, that does not make their oppression uh, more credible than somebody else's or their exploitation more credible than somebody else's or their uh, other injustice done to them more uh, uh, unjust than somebody else's. Uh, again, I think we have to get into a place of not uh, uh, expecting the victim uh, to be uh, have a better behavior than the one who has done the victimizing. We have to get into the place of, of holding the victim accountable for uh, the emotions of the victimized, for the way that the victimized reacts, understanding what precipitated these emotions that have come from people who have had uh, these victimizations done to them. And so even again, even though I think that it is admirable that that is Dr. King's ideology, and I think that it's one that uh, I personally uh, work every day to try to get closer to uh, being able to uh, be, remain calm in the uh, face of situations that would provoke anger, to uh, not become bitter in certain situations, to not become up. Uh, uh, upset in certain situations and I believe uh, at times I've been better at that at times I, uh, uh, I've had uh, I've left I've left things to be desired in that category uh, but that has never changed uh, whether the things that I was standing for was more right uh, the things that I stand for did not be were not 
uh, more right because I didn't get into an argument with somebody or because I didn't return somebody's yelling with yelling or because somebody uh, yelled out a racial slur and I didn't yell something back at them. Uh, the uh, injustices did not become, you know, the nature of the injustices did, did not change. Uh, okay, let's, I don't want to, I'm double talking, so let's keep pushing. We got 10% battery. I'm going to do this to the battery all the way, all the way low, low. And then I'm going to charge this phone up and we try to hop back on again later tonight. After the opposition have failed to negotiate us into a compromise, it turned to subtler means for blocking the protest, namely to conquer by dividing. False rumors were spread concerning the leaders of the movement. During this period, the rumor was spread that I had purchased a brand new Cadillac for myself and a Buick station wagon for my wife. Of course, none of this was true. Not only was there a conscious attempt to raise questions about the integrity of the Negro leaders and thereby cause their followers to lose faith in them, there was also an attempt to divide the leaders among themselves. Prominent white citizens went to many of the older Negro ministers and said, quote, if there has to be a protest, you should be the leaders. It is the same for you who have been in the community for so many years to have your own people overlook you and choose these young upstarts to lead them, end quote. Certain members of the white community tried to convince several of the other protest leaders that the problem could be solved if I were out of the picture. Quote, if one of you, end quote, they would say, took over the leadership, things would change overnight. I almost broke down under the continual battering of this argument. I began to think that there might be some truth in it, and I also feared that some were being influenced by this argument. After two or three troubled days and nights of little sleep, I called a meeting of the executive board and offered my resignation. I told them that I would be the last person to want to stand in the way of a solution to the problem which plagued our community and that maybe a more mature person could bring about a speedier conclusion. I further assured the board that I would be as active in the background as I had been in the position of spokesman. But I had barely finished talking before board members began to urge me from every side to forget this idea of resignation. With a unanimous vote of confidence, they made it clear that they were well pleased with the way I was handling things and that they would follow my leadership to the end. Uh, and then I think that that's something that's also, uh, I sort of want to dive into that a little bit. Chair on uneven ground out here and shit. I want to dive into that a little bit. Uh, the, the divide and conquer tactics have always been a method used by white power structures, by white uh, uh, supremacy structures by white nationalist structures uh, dividing and conquer uh, black people dividing and conquer indigenous people dividing and conquer people of color dividing and conquering poor people uh, playing them at playing poor people who are black against poor people who are white when in reality they share the same interests. playing working class people who are Hispanic against working class people uh, who are uh, 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 African immigrants even though really they have the same interests. playing working class uh, and, and again uh, Racism is something that is used uh, to uh, to further that agenda, uh, and a lot of and, uh, and you know and so I, I say all these things to say that we must be aware of the divide and conquer tactics when they happen, uh, and I think part of that is. Uh, uh, having uh, open lines of communication with uh, other members of the community who are struggling for the same things that we have. Uh, whatever, whatever people may say about uh, the May 30th Alliance or myself, uh, we are always at City Hall. Uh, since October 3rd, if you were trying to find us, you could come down to City Hall. You might not always find the exact person that you're looking for, but you can find us here. Uh, and there might be times where somebody is going to the bathroom or going to get something to eat or in a car or something like that uh, and, and in one moment. Uh, but there are people always here, and if you came back or come back or circle the block, spin the block, uh, you will be able to uh, uh, speak to somebody who can communicate our ideologies, communicate our philosophies, communicate our beliefs, and communicate the, uh, the, why we believe the means that we are using are justified by the ends that we are trying to get to, and how if uh, we are all on the same page of trying to get to the same ends of, of any police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice, and making this a more equitable society and a more humane society, uh, then we should not be uh, allowing divide and conquer tactics from white institutions and from white power uh, structures uh, to be used against us and to be successful against us. Uh, and so uh, you see how uh, Dr. King and the Montgomery Improvement Association combated those divide and conquer tactics by uh, having trust and having faith uh, in one another uh, and by having open lines of communication. 
Uh, let's see. Mm. My fault, my fault. Okay. The wind blowing, I lost my page. Okay. I'm going to knock out a couple more paragraphs and then we're going to end this live. The phone battery getting low. Afterward, as I drove up to the parsonage, more at peace than I had been in some time, I could hear Coretta's high, true soprano through the living room window. In the back bedroom, Yoki, now more than a month old, was wide awake and busy discovering her fingers. I picked her up and walked to the front room, bouncing her in time to Coretta's song. Such moments together have become rare. We could never plan them, for I seldom knew from one hour to the next when I would be home. Many times Coretta saw her good meals grow dry in the, grow dry in the oven when a sudden emergency kept me away. Yet she never complained, and she was always there when I needed her. Yoki and Beethoven, she said, kept her company when she was alone. Calm and unruffled, Coretta moved quietly about the business of keeping the household going. When I needed to talk things out, she was ready to listen or to offer suggestions when I asked for them. The height of the attempt to conquer by dividing came on Sunday, January 22nd, when the city commissioners shocked the Negro community by announcing in the local newspaper that they had met with the group of prominent Negro ministers and worked out a settlement. Many people were convinced the boycott was over. It was soon clear that this announcement was a calculated design to get the Negroes back on the buses Sunday morning. The city commission felt certain that once a sizable number of Negroes began riding the buses, the boycott would end. And so again, you see the, uh, this is now the city leaders who, have, who are going about uh, uh, the deception and, the, and subterfuge in this manner. Uh, as opposed to before when it was the police who uh, went about uh, forcing the cab drivers to raise their charge fare from uh, the 10 cents that they were doing to try to uh, accommodate uh, the people who were uh, uh, boycotting the buses. Uh, they forced them to raise it to 45 cents, threatening to uh, issue citations to the taxi drivers, to the cab drivers. Uh, and so that was the police heading that one up. But they were doing it uh, on behest and in coordination with the city's fathers uh, and, uh, and the, the city's City government, which the city fathers is. Uh, and so now you see that the city government has taken the reins and has taken the lead on the on the uh, action to try to uh, stop me to boycott by using a by putting out lies in the newspaper, by using media manipulation. Uh, we've seen the city of Rockford use media manipulation and putting out lies in the newspapers when uh, they called the memorials trash in the newspapers. Uh, and then we uh, uh, then we uh, uh, brought up that they called these memorials trash in the newspapers and then they tried to uh, move the goalposts to say no that that's not what that's not the trash that they were referring to uh, we've seen it as uh, the city government lied in press releases they put out about uh, about the occupation in City Hall when they lied and said that we were blocking the entrance when we weren't lo blocking the entrance the mayor has lied and said that we were, we were violating uh, 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 laws for people who are uh, handicapped to move on the sidewalk, which is also, uh, you know, a, another false uh, a falsity. These are all lies that they have put out through the media. And so, again, we see how in 2021 in Rockford, the same tactics are being used uh, by Mayor Tom McNamara and his administration as were being used in Montgomery in 1954 uh, by racist segregationists. Uh, and so that is the reason that we uh, call the mayor of this city racist, that we call the mayor of this city uh, 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 anti-black and prejudice and bigoted, because he uh, his institutional philosophies fall in line with other people who were glorified racists and glorified segregationists and bigots. Uh, and then as well, well, when we talk about this type of subterfuge and deception being used, last year the uh, this move, the uh, struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice uh, was. Uh, uh, was the, the the organization at the helm of it was Rockford Youth Abolitionists, uh, and you've seen how the city of Rockford created another group with the exact same acronyms uh, that was Rockford Youth in Action with two people that they just randomly picked and put together, courtesy of 815 Eliminate Racism, another a racist group with the word Eliminate Racism in their name. They picked these people and put them out to try to co-op the movement and the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice and in hopes to confuse people on which group was which. Uh, and so these are the same type of tactics. Uh, that we are reading about in this literature, in this book by Autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. that is also being used uh, in this city, Rockford, Illinois. 
I began to wonder whether any of my associates had betrayed me and made an, assign and made an agreement in my absence. I needed to find out if a group of Negro ministers had actually met with the city commission. After about an hour of calling here and there, they were able to identify the, quote, three prominent Negro ministers, end quote. They were neither prominent nor were they members of the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association. It was now about 11 o'clock on Saturday night. Something had to be done to let the people know that the article they would read the next morning was false. I asked one group to call all the Negro ministers of the city and urge them to announce in the church on Sunday morning that the protest was still on. Another group joined me on a tour of the Negro nightclubs and taverns to inform those present of the false statement. For the first time, I had a chance to see the inside of most of Montgomery's night spots. As a result of our fast maneuvering, the word got around so well that the next day the buses were empty as usual. With the failure of the attempted hoax, the city fathers lost face. They were now desperate. Their answer was to embark on a, quote, get tough policy, end quote. The mayor went on television and denounced the boycott. The vast majority of white Montgomerians, he declared, did not care if a Negro ever rode the buses again, and he called upon the white employers to stop driving Negro employees to and from work. During this period, all three city commissioners let it be known that they had joined the White Citizens Council. The quote, get tough, end quote, policy turned out to be a series of arrests for minor and often imaginary traffic violations. Faced with these difficulties, the volunteer carpool began to weaken. Some drivers became afraid that their licenses would be revoked or their insurance canceled. Many of the drivers quietly dropped out of the pool. It became more and more difficult to catch a ride. Complaints began to rise. From early morning to late at night, my telephone rang and my doorbell was seldom silent. I began to have doubts about the ability of the Negro community to continue the struggle. Okay, and then we will stop right there. Uh, we uh, have many more pages to go in uh, this chapter, about 10 more pages, 11 more pages to go in this chapter. This is chapter 8 of the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this chapter is entitled The Violence of Desperate Men. Uh, and we have seen... Uh, the tactics that being used by the Montgomery City government and the Montgomery Police Department to try to end the bus boycott have approached everything except for, uh, well, now they just approach arrest for the first time, but prim primarily uh, had approached everything except for arrest and violence. Uh, and these are, again, the same things that we've seen happen here. Uh, they tried to use... Uh, uh, the, C, the divide and conquer tactics. They try to pretend to come to the table with you even though they don't have any true desire to have any type of agreement or compromise. Uh, and they do all these things in hopes of efforts to uh, psychologically wear you down or to mentally, emotionally wear you down. And when they see that they cannot psychologically wear you down or mentally and emotionally wear you down, uh, that is when they turn to uh, uh, try to physically uh, wear you down and to uh, begin to imprison your body and begin to uh, threaten physical violence against you because of the fact that they cannot conquer you uh, 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 mentally and emotionally and uh, psychologically. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to end this live the way we end the lives. Uh, we might be back later on. I'm not 100 percent sure yet. Uh, but watch, go back, watch this from the beginning. Go back, watch the uh, other uh, live we did uh, earlier today, reading the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and like I said, we might be back later on. Uh, so we want to say justice for Demetrius Bennett, uh, justice for Logan Bell, justice for Kerry Blake, justice for uh, Jovan Fresco, justice for Geno Washington, justice for Mark Barmore, uh, justice for Philip Johnson, justice for Jasper Banks. Justice for Suzette Babbler, uh, Justice for Fausto Guaytigo, Justice for Shannon Graves, uh, Justice for Joseph McCormick, uh, Justice for Lil Mike Sago, Justice for Mikey Guzman, and Justice for Eddie Patterson. We outside.